There are only a handful of stories that give us details about the birth and childhood of Jesus. Now, those stories are going to take us to the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Like I said, there's not many stories there. We're looking at one of them today. But when we think about the birth of Jesus, there are a number of songs that come to mind that, that bring a, a sense of presence, of peace, and of calmness when we sing those. Uh, think about these words. See if you can fill in the blank. Blank to the world, the Lord is come. Joy. When Jesus came to the world, He brought joy. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Holy infant so, tender and mild. Silent night. Speaking of the birth, of Jesus. One, one more. O oh, come, let us adore Him. O oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. In fact, it is that idea, it is the story of the Magi, the wise men, that will get our attention today as we look at those early years of Jesus. Now, John Ortberg, who has written the book, Who is This Man?, has this to say about the birth of Jesus. He says, He entered the world with no dignity. His cradle was a feeding trough. His nursery mates had four legs. He was born in a cave, targeted for death, raised on the run. He would die with even less dignity, convicted, beaten, bleeding, abandoned, naked, and shamed. He had no status. Dignity on the level of a king is the last word you would associate with Jesus. But that word king is one that is associated with the birth and childhood of Jesus. It's going to be a great study for us today. We're landing in Matthew chapter 2 for the large part of our study. And, and here's the interesting question. What is the purpose of Matthew chapter 2? Here's what's interesting. If you look at the end of chapter 1, uh, Matthew chapter 1 ends with the birth of Jesus. Matthew chapter 3 begins with the ministry of Jesus. So there is about a 30-year gap from the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 3. So what is the purpose of chapter 2? Here's something that I find interesting. Donald Hagner has written the Word Biblical Commentary for the Gospel of Matthew. He says it would thus be possible to skip from chapter 2 to chapter 3 without any loss of continuity. What's he say? Well, if we didn't know that Matthew 2 was there, and we're reading chapter 1, and then we go to chapter 3, would we miss chapter 2? Not unless we had known that it was there. So that, boy, that just makes the question fascinating. What then is the purpose for Matthew chapter 2? I think we can answer that question this morning, or at least a good solid answer of why chapter 2 is there. Let's get to Matthew chapter 2, begin reading in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, that word disturbed, King Herod was disturbed. Other translations will say that he was troubled, that he was upset. And one translation even says he was frightened. Now, the, the context of all of those words, again, what's significant? I think there were words that hit a nerve with Herod. And it was the question, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Now, Johnny, why would that be such a big deal to Herod? Thank you for asking. 
We'll go to John Ortberg again for some historical context here. To an ancient reader, Herod, not Jesus, would have been a picture of greatness. Born of noble birth, leader of armies, Herod was so highly regarded by the Roman Senate that they gave him the title King of the Jews when he was only 33 years old. So Herod the Great was so great that the Roman Senate recognized that and they gave him the title King of the Jews. Now there are magi, there are wise men that have come and, and talking about the birth of the King of the Jews and, and they want to know where he is so that, that they can go and worship him. And that phrase, King of the Jews, is one that really struck a nerve with King Herod. Herod is known as Herod the Great. He was a great builder. He had great projects. He was an effective leader. Jesus, meanwhile, had just been born. Even if we went a little bit ahead into his early life, he would have been one that, that likely learned the trade of his father. Joseph was a carpenter. And so here Herod was, and he had great projects, and, and Jesus likely built some things too. Which do you think were more notable at that particular time? Herod. What were some of the, the things that were built that might have lasted longer don't know, but it seems like with these great projects that the resources that are available, maybe Herod, all right? Let's keep moving. Keep this in mind. King of the Jews was a phrase that struck a nerve with Herod. With that in mind, we go to chapter 2, verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact Time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. So Herod is giving an appearance. He's giving an appearance that he's interested. He wants to find this child just as much as the wise men do. And when they find him, if they'll report that back to him, it would allow him, too, the opportunity to go and worship. When we go to chapter 2, verse 11, now this is the, the verse of the story that gathers the most attention when we think about the wise men visiting Jesus. This is going to be important. There are a couple of things that show up in this chapter that give us a pretty good idea that this event was not as closely associated with the birth as we often think. Now, it's interesting, like we said, there's only about a handful of stories concerning the birth and early life of Jesus. And so for them to be connected, obviously we don't have a lot to connect. But the fact, first of all, we're going to find out that, that Mary and Joseph are now at home. And we've got another big one coming up later. So just remember this. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Verse 12, attention now, squarely on the wise men. Having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. They did not want to have anything to do with what Herod's plot, what his plan might have been. In verse 13, the attention turns to Joseph and to Mary. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And so now there is a warning. 
now an angel has spoken to talk about the danger that, uh, that Joseph and Mary and Jesus are facing because Herod is going to come looking for him and it's not to worship him. In verse 16, we begin to see really this other side of Herod that we're talking about. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. That is another indicator that this might not have been at the time, exactly at the birth. But again, remember, we're talking about early years of Jesus. Uh, we're talking about an infant. I mean, if you're talking about two years or under, that's still really young, right? And so that's the timeline that it appears we're working with. Uh, if Jesus was older than that, then Herod had just missed the timing. But going based on what he had heard from the Magi, he gave orders to kill children, two years old and under. Boy, we, we go here and we see a different side of Herod. He goes from being, what was the, the, the word? Frightened? He was frightened? No, now he's just mean and vicious. All right? Uh, look in verse 18. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. We are seeing a side of Herod, an angry, furious, a vicious side of him. He is, he is calling his soldiers to go into homes, and they are invading their homes, and there's nothing the people in the homes can do about it. They are going, and if they find a young boy, two years of age or younger, they're, they're killing the baby, likely on the spot. No wonder there's such great mourning. And Matthew wants to make sure as he's writing this account, because Matthew chapter 2 is there for a reason, and it's giving us an idea of something about Herod. We're also going to learn something about Jesus. But in the midst of this, we are seeing just the, the, the hurt and the pain and the suffering that was taking place in the land under Herod the Great. Now, Herod may have been great, but like I said, he was mean and vicious. Even on his deathbed, there were a group of protesters, and, and Herod had the, the leader, the ringleader of that group, along with some prominent members of it. And, and, but then, again, ultimately, just everybody. He had them executed. Herod had his own son killed, for trying to take power too quickly. It's like Herod saying, I'm not gone yet. But he was acting in a very uh, hard-fisted manner. Herod gave orders for prominent Israelites to be executed at his death. The reason he did that was so that there would be mourning in Israel at the time of his death. This information is not provided in Matthew. This is extra-biblical information. It comes from history books. Because history books note about Herod and about how, how powerful he was, how great he was, but also how vicious and mean he was. So we make sure that we get a total picture of this man that was in charge at the time of the birth of Jesus. Matthew chapter 2. Well, we've gone through a lot. Have magi that heard about the birth of Jesus. They're going, trying to get some idea of direction so that they can find him. Herod finds out. He's curious. He's frightened. And he wants to know more. So he asks them, give me directions. Let me know what you find out. But when they go, they worship and they take their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But they are warned not to go back the same way. And so they leave because they don't want to have anything to do with Herod and his plans. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. The family is warned by an angel to get out of town, to give them an idea of what Herod is going to be up against and what his plans are going to be. Herod was furious. 
goes out and gives orders for all young males, two years of age or under, to be put to death. Matthew chapter 2 concludes by letting us know that Herod the Great died. Herod the Great died. Now, chapter 3 will begin uh, just a completely different format in Matthew. We will go from having blocks of ministry of what Jesus did and where he went to blocks of teaching of what Jesus taught. You have uh, chapters 3 and 4 are ideas, they're outlines of that ministry. Chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount is that block of teaching. And that pattern repeats itself through Matthew's Gospel. But there is something to be learned from Matthew chapter 2. It is not just information and a chapter to fill between chapters 1 and 3. It's there for a reason. Here's what I find interesting. After this time of Herod the Great. Now, you will find some instances in history. I get that. Some instances in history of where people will be called the Great. But over time, and it didn't take long, you will watch those number of occurrences drastically decline. But something else happens in Matthew's Gospel and after this time. And it focuses on children. The word child is used some eight times in Matthew chapter 2. I want us to just look at a sampling of those, okay? Uh, This is just a sampling of the verses that you'll read in Matthew chapter 2 that include the word child. Go and search carefully for the child. It stopped over the place where the child was. They saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt. So we have this emphasis on Jesus being called the child. Now, Herod is a great leader, a powerful leader, a hard-fisted leader. But there is an a, a interesting contrast that develops in this chapter because you've got a king, you've got the great, Herod the great. Then over here, you've got a child. There is, in Jesus' day, in these early days, there was a clear order of rank. And leaders like Herod would have been at the top of the ladder. They would have been the ones that everyone looked up to, everyone followed. And if you ask people, who do you want to be like, they would rather be like Herod than they would a child. Why is that? Because children were at the bottom of the ladder. This is very interesting. The Greek and Latin words for children. Both languages... Word for children means not speaking. Why is that so significant? Because in that day and time, children's voices were not heard. Uh, they They were seen in the same category as slaves. But now here we have Jesus, and Matthew chapter 2 reminds us that as society looked at children this way, that Jesus was born and was a child. And it's going to change a lot. It has drastic change in the way, in the future, that even we will look at children. Now see, even back in Jesus' day, children would have been seen as weak, helpless, dependent, fragile, defenseless, vulnerable, at risk. Now, those are not qualities that are associated with being a hero. They're just not. But when Jesus came, and Jesus began to teach, and Jesus began to talk about being childlike, He's going to take a lot of these very ideas, and He's going to raise them up to a level 
of importance when we talk about qualities to be like Jesus. And this idea of being weak and helpless, you know, Jesus talks about being poor in spirit. What does that mean? It means being humble, uh, recognizing the need for God. Without God's direction, I'm lost. Without our Father's direction, we're lost. Uh, so I, I think about these, and I think about the emphasis that Jesus is going to put on society, of those who are vulnerable, those who are at risk, those who are defenseless. Jesus is taking uh, this social status, this ladder, and, and the, just the whole hierarchy, and he's taking it and he's turning it upside down. And it's great to watch. Herod the Great. All right, so he was a builder. He was a powerful ruler. But Matthew chapter 2 leaves us with a clear message. Herod has died. Here's how emphatic that is. Chapter 2 verse 19, after Herod died. Chapter 2 verse 20, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. And then in chapter 2 verse 22, he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judah in place of his father Herod. Now, why was that? Because Herod had died. Herod the Great, these great projects. Herod had died. There is a wise man. I don't know who he is, but he is a wise man who issued this statement, who uttered this statement. Death is the great leveler. Now, in fact, uh, a story I read about this talks about a man who was given a watch. And there were words written on the, the hands of the watch. On one hand of the watch was written the word, remember. On the other hand of the watch was written the words, you will die. So any time, Anybody ask you, hey, what time is it? You could give them the time. But when you did, and you look down, those words just come off of the hands of that watch as a reminder. Remember, you will die. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, this is from the English Standard Version. His Bible tells us, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. So not only did Herod die, but just like everyone else who lived before or lived afterward, death and judgment, death and judgment. Herod would have to give an account for all of the lives of those children that he had slain. Herod would have to give an account for all of the vicious things that he had done during his reign. He would have to give an account for the things that he had done that had brought horror and had brought problems and had brought difficulties to other people. But before we get too busy looking at Herod and pointing our finger at him, I need to remind us, we too will face a judgment. We too will face the judgment before God of where we have to give an account have to give an account of the life we've lived, have to give an account for every careless word we have spoken is a bold reminder from Scripture. Remember, you will die. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 11 tells us, The eyes of the arrogant will be humbled, and human pride brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. How many times do we read, particularly in the New Testament, of passages like this? That those who are great will be humbled, and those who are humble will be made great. It's just over and over and over. Those who are first will be last, and those who are last will be first. It's this same message repeated over and over in Scripture. God exalts the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of God, and He will lift you up. It is a message that is repeated over and over. 
I've told you earlier we're wanting to go to Matthew chapter 18. Let's go there now, chapter 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. So Jesus, who is the greatest? Jesus did not answer Herod. Herod had built great things, but that did not make him great in the eyes of God. Herod had political shrewdness, but that did not make him great in the eyes of God. Herod was a powerful ruler, had ruthless spirit, but that did not make him great in the eyes of God. Herod was unmerciful. This is approach to people in the way that he took lives. But that did not make him great in the eyes of God. Instead, when Jesus was asked about greatness, Jesus reached and he grabbed a young child. An example of humility. An example of lowliness. And those very things that society at one time would have scoffed over Jesus elevated to a level of importance, so much so that he says, unless you change, unless you convert and become like this little child, have these childlike qualities. Unless you do that, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And here's the great news for us today. Jesus came and he brought salvation to all. Jesus, let me clarify that. Jesus died on the cross so that our sins might be forgiven. Without Jesus, there is no hope. But Jesus died so that when we are baptized into Christ, His blood washes us free of our sins. It cleanses us. Jesus came so that all could have an opportunity for salvation. But Jesus did something else, and we see it, from Matthew chapter 2, and then again in chapter 18, of where Jesus brought dignity to children. Jesus brought dignity to children. In fact, one of my favorite verses in the New Testament, James chapter 1, verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans, and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So what does pure religion look like? Well, it looks like taking care of children and taking care of widows. Taking care of children who are in need and taking care of widows in their time of need. That's what pure religion looks like. So I just have to tell you, if we want to look like Jesus... Man, if we want to follow the words of Jesus and we desire to be great, what is that going to look like? What is that going to mean for us? Well, if we want to look like Jesus, if we want to live like Jesus, then we need to share the gospel. Jesus went and He preached the good news wherever He went. And we too need to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus, wherever we go. If we want to be like Jesus, then we need to care for the poor, the hungry, the downtrodden, those that society would put at the bottom of the ladder, that they would overlook, that they would pass by. Jesus says if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you stop and you look after people like that. In fact, there will be a time when Jesus says, He'll look and He'll separate the sheep from the goats. He'll tell the sheep, He said, man, you, you, you were great. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. And He keep goes on. And, and then the people say, when did we see you? And Jesus says, I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. So if we want to be like Jesus, if we want to look like Him, well, we're going to care for the poor, the hungry, the downtrodden. We will recognize the greatness of children. 
It's interesting to see how at times, even in my lifetime, that we have seen and and we've treated like children. Like children have their place and it's there. Get them away. They, They don't belong here. I've got to tell you something, church. Children have got to be a focus of who we are and what we're about. I do not understand this idea. I don't, I'm not trying to pick one or the other, okay? But at some point, how do we get this idea of supporting this missionary there and supporting this ministry out there? And we have children in our midst, and we're doing nothing to teach them, to support them, to train them to be men and women of God. In fact, what Jesus has told us, we could learn something from them. And maybe it's as simple as the fact that greatness comes through humility. Jesus was born likely in a cave with the manger, with that feeding trough as his first bed. And we, we know about the cruel death on the cross. Jesus lived a life of humility. And God exalted him to the highest place. Gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. The question is this, is will we follow this this instruction, this example, this guidance that the Lord has put before us. Man, I, I just think about this. First of all, what are we doing with Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus? Do you believe in Him? Are you putting your faith in Him? Are you ready to confess your sins, to repent? Are you ready to name Jesus as the Lord of your life? And be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Understand, we've got to see who Jesus is. Jesus has set an example for us. He's offered His life as a sacrifice for us, but He has set an example for us as well. What are we doing with Jesus? Also on this list, we need to ask the question of, of what are we doing with others? When we think about this idea of greatness, what what is it that strikes us as greatness? Is it power? Is it prestige? Is it awards? Is it uh, accolades and other things? Or do we find greatness in being humble, being gentle, being compassionate, being like Jesus? So how are we treating other people? You you see, you, you don't have to go far in the world where we'll just pass somebody by whether it's a child in need, whether it's an adult in need, whether it's an older adult in need. We have an excuse for everything, don't we? At least in America, at least these days we do. Will we be like Jesus? Care, compassion for the hungry, for the downtrodden. You see, there's a great lesson. In watching Herod, one who was great, be brought low. But Jesus, who was born in this very environment of humility, grew up living a life of humility, of service, and pointing us to children and saying, if you really want to be great in the kingdom of God, then you need to change. You need to convert and learn those childlike qualities and implement those in your life. Perhaps this morning that's something that you need to do. If that's the case, and, and, and you're watching us today, and you're thinking, I want to do something about this, I hope you'll reach out to us and give us a call at 870-836-5038. Perhaps you're ready to give your life to Jesus and to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Perhaps you need to, to sit down and study a little more about this idea of priorities and what mission and purpose in life should really be about. Perhaps you want to, 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 to renew your commitment to the Lord, to be restored to faithful service to the Lord. Man, we'd love to help you any way we can. 
give us a call at 870-836-5038.